now we've got a piece of more. Now, what I haven't done is got a whole page and a half of uh, introduction, which I, which I ought to have, but he's Peter Boer, and I hope he will spend a moment or two just uh, saying who he is and how he, how he managed to get here. <laughs> <laughs> not, just, not just today, but uh, okay. in, in general. Fine. And we've got a lot of cables there. Are you okay I'll, I'll with, okay with that? Are you okay, I'm not, with, okay I'm not with that? Too much. And uh, Thanks, I think what we really ought to do is thank you for coming. And I really, <laughs> really, 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 really. Well, I hope you've all had a relaxing day because um, mine started about half past nine this morning at Haymarket Station uh, with a delayed train, um, which then duly came an hour and a half later and terminated at Stirling, followed by another train an hour and a half later, which terminated at Perth, and followed by a hopper bus to Broxton and City Link, which broke down because the windscreen wipers couldn't cope with the rain. <laughs> and so they had to get somebody out to sort the windscreen wiper. And then eventually I ended up in Aviemore, and I got a taxi back to Canusi, where my car was, and then back home, and then back up here. So it's been a bit of a kind of whirlwind, but it became a point of honor just Paul Graham has been receiving texts and updates all the way through the day because I was sort of going, well, I think I'm going to get there. Be all right. You know, this was about midday. And then I was about three or four o'clock, I was thinking, well, I'm not sure I'm going to get there, actually. <laughs> anyway. Um, and, and, and it's 7.29. <laughs> right on time. I hope none of you are relying on public transport for your way home because uh, uh, my sage advice to anybody is not to do anything if it, <laughs> Uh, hasn't been dry for about 48 hours beforehand. Anyway, um, thanks very much. Great, thank you for turning out and uh, great to see you. Um, so I'm going to talk about Alex Leddingham. Um, some of you will be aware that during the summer we had an exhibition at Grantham Museum and uh, there was a book published alongside it, um, which was just basically a, 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 a little bit of a history about um, the Leddingham photographers at Grantham. And um, particularly about Alex Leddingham, the, the originator. And uh, at the time, I, when we launched the book and the exhibition, uh, I did a, a short talk, and I've added a few more bits and bobs into that, um, just things that were very book focused, that was. So there's a few other things I wanted to say tonight. My own kind of um, journey with, with, with Alex Leddingham's photographs started quite a long time ago. Um, I, I, I have become, but I wasn't particularly a postcard collector. But um, the one thing, and it'll, it'll come out in the talk a bit later on, but the, the one thing with postcards is they give you a, a really cheap access to really good photographs. And particularly when you've got, if you have, um, a local photographer documenting the area, uh, like, 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 well, both Lenin's, in fact, Sandy Lenin, there's some also did it as well. Um, so I bought a, a postcard in the what used to be well it's now a house food shop and used to be an antique shop in Newton Moor and it was a picture outside of um, of the square as it were opposite the main hotel and I thought well that's quite interesting number, I think it was number eighty six of the uh, of the postcard range and I thought well, that's quite interesting I'll, I'll maybe have a look around the other eighty five <laughs> and about a month later I bought sort of like. 280, number 280 something down in St Andrew. Uh, this isn't going to be quite as easy as all that. Um, so th 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 there's been a couple of bits, and I, I worked a bit with um, with Molly Duckett, who was the um, curator of the museum, probably back in the in the sort of the early part of the of the of the century. Um, and we put together an exhibition which was basically about the Leading photographers, and that was very much focused on Sandy Leddingham's um, photographs and a lot of people sort of knew of his work and knew him and had their weddings and their children and their school portraits done by him so there was, a, there was quite a, a sort of buzz around that one. Um, in, in, the, in the sort of following years on that um, I did some research at Aberdeen University uh, and in fact did a PhD on um, re-photography so I was using old photographs and comparing the new with, with the with, with, with sort of new photos, going back to the exact location and reframing the picture. It's quite a sort of common practice these days, but I, I sort of went into it in a rather geeky way. And um, and also sort of travelled around. I got a, I got a fellowship to well, go around the world pretty well and look at various rephotographic practices and uh, and then 
have been publishing on that. So a, a little bit of that is going to be introduced into the into the um, talk as we go, um, and I'll try and fill in something I've I've forgotten. I have some copies of the book if anybody hasn't got and would like. Oh, it works. Perfect. So, this may be a Leddingham photograph. We don't, we don't really know. It's, it's, it's part of the W.R. Stewart collection um, in Graham's uh, safe, safekeeping. And it features the um, sort of the shots from the corner of Space Street, uh, from the corner of Space Street down Main Street there. And you can see right in the middle Alex Leddingham, photo artist and um, Angus Stewart, or A. Stewart, uh, the station is next door. Um, and it was quite, this was quite an interesting one, this is, as I say, it's, it's, it's a plate um, that, that Graham had, it's about the only picture I've, I've found of the, the actual Leningham premises, what it looked like, where it was, and it's a fantastic picture. Um, I was actually able to scan it very, very high resolution uh, from the glass plate, and you can read, or I could read, the, the, the newspaper billboard there, which had a headline which says, Country House Ghosts Baronet's Experience. So um, I duly Googled that, and it came up as, a, as, as being a thing in September of 1909. So this is a, this is a sort of 1909 <coughs> picture. And it was the year after Alex Leddingham set up shop at 60 The High Street. Um, I think one of the things that came to light, or, or, or was, I was able to slightly untangle um, during the process of, of, of putting the book together in the exhibition, was this very close association between Alex Leddingham and Angus Stewart. Um, Angus was obviously extremely influential in Grand Town, um, publisher of the Grand Supplement, and you know, undoubtedly a driving force behind very much in the town at the time. As you can see, they had neighbouring premises, and the two businesses were actually complementary and mutually beneficial to each other, photographer, publisher, printer, and so forth. Um, so this is Alex and his wife in the shop at 60th High Street, um, his wife Margaret, and I'm guessing this was taken sometime towards the end of his working life in the late 1940s or the early 50s. And it's, um, it's, it's actually a very, very small photograph, but beautiful quality. And it's just actually sort of kicking around in a, in a, in a sort of family box, shoe box of photographs. And I, I pulled it out and straightened it up and I tidied it up for the, for, for the book. Um, but it's, um, it's a really sort of really, in real life or in, in, in actuality, it would have been a lovely sort of bright picture with those sort of Kodak and Ilford sort of colours involved in it. So it's a picture of him at work. He was born in 1883 in Forrest, attended Forrest Academy. And in the 1901 census, he was found as an assistant photographer, but he was down in Peebles. He obviously got and done a bit of training down there. And in 1904, he moved to work for a company, um, quite a famous company, called DW Profit in Dundee. Um, there are a couple of sort of family albums kicking around, still in, 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 in their possession, which I was very, um, uh, very kindly granted access to while working on the book and the exhibition. And I've just included a couple of pages here. I did, I did some scans from um, quite a bit of them, just to sort of try to, well, just to sort of capture documents. You never know where they're going to end up at some point. Hopefully they'll end up right back here, but you, just never, you never really know. So I, I, I scanned a few of the, the um, pages. And uh, including in this, you know, this presentation, to illustrate the sort of content that Alex Levin put together uh, for his for, for himself, really. Um, so this first one involves um, a royal visit to Edinburgh in 1903, and he's got the naval brigade and the lancers, and then he's got a sort of picture of the, the, of the king and queen at the top there, which is which is probably the best he could do. Um, uh, Edward the Seventh, and um, you know, it's quite sort of. It's quite. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit of a signal. He's obviously a young man there in his late teens, and it's a bit of a signal as to the sort of the care and presentation he put into putting his work together. I mean, he's obviously sort of drawn around that. It's, you know, it's not, a, it's not a perfect fix, but it's, a, it's it's an interesting way of presenting. And it was obviously put together so that either he would refer back to it, or maybe he'd show it to other people, and uh, so the, 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 the sort of meticulous. Um, 
And there's also a faded page here, which is um, titled Whalers at Dundee. Or at least it's not particularly faded, faded but it's uh, the process, the chemicals haven't possibly haven't been fixed quite right, or there's been some kind of a page on top of them which has turned them a bit. But there's some wonderful content again in those, and individually, um, in detail, they are quite incredible. Uh, and so this is a, a, a page which is titled Whalers at Dundee, Leaving for the Fishing Grounds. Um, uh, and again, you know, it's likely these were taken when he was working at Profits in Dundee. He was just knit down and, and documented this. But again, there's just that, that sort of bit about sort of, um, they're not just ordinary pictures, they're pictures he has taken, he has curated, he has put together and presented here. Dundee was, of course, a busy place at the time, and you know, he chose to photograph this aspect of one of its, industri in one of its industries. And so both these pages show a desire to record events, which I think is you know, what we've now really called documentary photography. And you know, he, he afforded his work a bit of status by setting his pictures out like this. I haven't quite worked out what these um, hand-drawn motifs signify. I mean, they're possibly flowers, but you know, each one is kind of unique in its, in its appearance. Um, I'm not sure they particularly add to it, but anyway, that's, that's all by the by. It's, it's an interesting sort of package of of photographs. So while he was away at Profits in Dundee, Alex, um, in 1907, there were the signs um, being published in the paper, and obviously no doubt chat around, around, the, around here, um, that one of the local photographers was in trouble. Um, Alexander Torrey, who had studios, his principal studio was in Forres. And uh, but he also had his studio in Granton on Space Street. And he hit financial difficulties in 1907. And by Christmas, just before Christmas, he was declared bankrupt. Now, it was quite an interesting, um, obviously very fast move on Alex Leddingham's part, because he swooped and very shrewdly purchased not only the studio at Granton, um, he, he didn't go into the forest one, but not only the Cedar Granton, but he also purchased Torrey's back catalogue of legacies and was able to provide reprints from those to his customers while his own business was established. And you can see it here. Um, Hayal is in a position to execute all orders entrusted to him by a satisfactory, in a satisfactory manner. Um, and having taken, secured all the negatives taken by Mr. Torrey. Hayal hopes his personal attention to business to secure, will secure a liberal amount of patronage. And indeed it did. This was in the Elgin and Nairn Gazette on the 25th of March, 1908. So that was after he kicked off, he left profits, he'd come home, and he, um, he was kicking off with his own studio business. Um, so one of the early documentaries uh, was of the fire which took a hold of Angus Stewart's premises on, on the corner of Space Street and, and, and High Street. Um, it's not a great reproduction. Um, it's a clip from the online newspaper archive from the Grants and Supplement of September 1908, I think. And it is, but it's nonetheless significant. And certainly, you know, I suggest from Alex's point of view, um, it's significant because it was probably his first publication. And it would have been, um, he would have just documented, taken a photograph of the, the remnants of the fire at the, at the buildings. And then Angus Stewart would have included that in the, um, in the, in the supplement. And alongside that is a notice on the far side, you know, basically um, just putting, putting, some, putting the notice of the fire out there, the fact that they're still trading, and they've got a sale of salvage books that will take place at an early date. So he's, he's, he's going to ship on some of his damaged stock. Um, but anyway, it was, it's, it's just quite an interesting sort of. Um, well, I suppose it's sort of use of photography quite early on in a provincial kind of context. And following on from the pages um, where, he's, he's, where um, Alex is, is, is kind of putting stuff together, you know, quite um, quite carefully. Um, one of his one of his early commissions here, uh, Alexander Grant from the Brays. Um, it also gives him this, gives this idea of, of personal attention to his business. Uh, it's a magnificent sort of presentation portrait. I would guess you, you'll, you'll have seen it. It's in the collection at the museum. It was on display this summer. And what it is, is in fact an oil painting. 
and it's been hand painted in oils over probably over a photograph. So it's, it's mounted um, and it's a, it's a really superb representation. Um, he, ha he was photographed by a few photographers. Um, there are one or two portraits of him kicking around, but I think this is probably the most magnificent. And you can see bottom right, or maybe not, but it's signed letting him um, uh, in the style of the photographic artist. Um, and it, it, it's, it's very much, well, it's a strange one in that the, the photographs of the day, as we'll see in a, in a bit, you know, usually featured a, a canvas backdrop, which is hand painted. And, and what they've done is instead of putting putting in, a, in, a, in the context of the hills of the, the braes of, of Glen Limit, um, again, they've set in a studio context and, and just painted it in. But it is a, it's a wonderful, wonderful portrait. So Alex Leddingham, um, the picture on the left, riding at the side of a bike and um, in uniform. I wasn't sure it was Leddingham. I wasn't convinced. I couldn't get anybody to um, to officially identify him. Uh, none of the family were going to risk it. So I, I, I kind of was suspicious. But um, when I finally got through the, the family photographs, I found the one on the right, uh, which is a, a, a later picture, but is undoubtedly him, and the same number plate on the bike. So we're, we're okay on that one. And um, Alex's sort of departure for the war was delayed. There's a little bit of that um, comes through on the, on, on the newspapers. Um, he appealed, uh, along with Angus Stewart, in fact, to, um, to, to, you know, to, to miss the draft to begin with. And um, indeed, that was successful. They got a few months' grace from being drafted and uh, called up in order to find replacement people to, to run their businesses while they were away. So he, he joined the war a little bit late, later than that. And it's quite interesting just to get that documentary of, of him um, in, his, in his uniform. So um, in setting up his, his business, um, he was very much a photo artist, high class photography in all its branches, natural portraits of children's speciality. And uh, amateur plates also developed, so that was, the, that was the, some of the nuts and bolts of his business, whereby photography was becoming more, um, more widespread. People were using box brownies and so forth um, to capture their own images, and they needed somewhere to get those to buy the equipment and also uh, get the films developed. So he provided that service. But also, he had local view postcards, photo frames, pictures, etc., from the studio in, in Granton. And some of the local, um, notable local events he recorded, so part of this documentary, um, he, um, this again will be one of the series that you'll be well aware of and will probably have seen in exhibitions at, at the museum. But it's um, nonetheless, a, a, you know, an important set of work and also high quality. And once you've got this, got the idea that photographers could produce photographs as postcards in postcard format, short supplies, and um, that people were willing to buy those and collect them and send them. Um, it became quite a quite a thing to do, and the quality of these is superb. This is so. This is, as I say, the, the theme of the Countess of Seafield. And he also did the um, the return of the new Earl and Countess. Uh, with the tenantry arch here, uh, and again, just you know, superb quality. So, I just want, yeah, so I suppose on the back of that, I just want to say something about just the importance of these photographs um, because you know, there are quite often a few of, or a few of these in the, in the museum collection, there are quite a lot in just individuals' collections as well, and they're available for a few quid online. And, you know, they're in the hands of slightly geeky collectors, and, and I do sort of include myself in that category. But quite often, these are the only surviving records of these events. They're really important. Um, you won't find the glass plate of that. It will have existed somewhere, but you won't find that. It won't be kicking about. And a lot of these are just, these are the only records. Um, you know, and it's unlikely that the plate of this or any other Seafield-related events survives. So they've got a really important kind of role to fill. And also, 
I suppose by, you know, if you use the index of what's available online, what's available on the eBay, uh, I mean, these are pretty rare, these are pretty rare cards. They do occasionally come up. But, um, you know, the ones that come up of Alex Leddingham's are the, usually the old Stay Bridge and, and a few other views in Grand Town. And, um, you know, great cards that they are, but the rare ones, these ones, l producing low numbers are the real sort of, are the real treasures. And that's also, you know, the same for this picture. Now, this picture isn't a Leddingham picture, but it's a, it's a Washington Wilson. Um, and it's a, well, I put it in because we're here. Kind of style, and um, it's you know it's again it's a really important. Now that even that one, that is probably the only surviving record, unless anybody knows differently. But I mean, I think that is probably a print of that is certainly the only surviving record. It doesn't seem to be in the in the main archive, which is in the University of Aberdeen. And um, I have been through that fairly fairly well. I mean, it might be tucked away in the back, unidentified as an unidentified building, but I haven't found it yet. So. Uh, again, you know, it's just it's just pointing out that when you get these plates or these pictures or these these printed items, they're quite often the only one. And I'll maybe just sort of mention a little bit beyond this, uh, just later on, as, uh, about sort of how they might be come to be replaced or or, or, or left and orphaned. Um, you, you you may have seen this one, um, the Grant and Bowling Club, in nineteen twenty seven twenty eight. It's a Levium photograph, and this is from um, their, their family album. Um, what you have here is you have the one that you probably have seen at the top there, um, but the, the ones at the bottom are Levium and his three children. So you've got William, Sandy, and Margaret on the right there as his, his daughter. And he's, he's taken both those uh, just in order to be able to um, sort of capture the, their particular role within that community. And obviously it's a really good community picture, just a brilliant community picture. So I wanted to say something about just about how you build a you know a collection of postcards, not not how you collect but but, but the, uh, collection of postcards, that, that's that's pretty straightforward. But if you were a photographer, what are you going to do to put together? And you know, obviously, well ultimately you've got to have You've got to have a range of postcards, and you've got to have pictures of things that people want to buy. And um, well, they want to buy, they want to, they want to keep, or they want to send to someone else for their collection. And Alex's early photography; these are these are some of his earlier works. Um, and they sort of followed an 18th and early 19th century model, really, where you sort of documented the wild and romantic highlands. It was all coming in a little bit, but it was, it was actually kicking off before Queen Victoria, but was really sort of amplified and endorsed by Queen Victoria during the 1850s and 60s. But these photographs were avidly consumed, and if you look around, you'll see you know, lots of pictures of Rumbling Bridge and the Hermitage and the Keld, and um, huge tumbling waterfalls, Plodder up in Glen Affleck features as well. And then you get these sort of boulders and these mossy trees and everything else. And it's a real kind of, um, you know, it's just a really sort of um, idyllic, kind of picturesque landscape. Now, it finds its roots, this kind of way of thinking, finds its roots way back in, well, back in the, in the, the kind of 17th century, in fact, with, um, with, with, with a cleric called William Gilpin. And he actually set out and published books about how you would appreciate the picturesque, how you would appreciate landscape, what needed to be in it in order to, to be, to, to, to be appreciate, appreciated. And he defined the picturesque as a, as a term expressive of that peculiar kind of beauty which is agreeable in a picture. And he made various tours, Gilpin, made various tours around the place in the 1760s, 1770s. And he later published journals of this, which he described as his rules for the appreciation of the picturesque. And it's quite interesting how influential those were. And places like, well, you know, sort of down, down the main, for example, on the A9, um, the Hermitage of Dunkeld, they were all places that were stopped off, uh, where he stopped off, and a tourist industry developed around that. So people started taking pictures of those particular locations, you see photographs of that. 
it was later picked up that people took pictures of and went to locations of Queen Victoria. So you get the Queen's views and various places where she stayed, where she dined at an inn and so forth. And, um, and it's just, just how these this sort of various influential aspects of tourism, highland tourism, um, sort of developed. Um, yeah, so I mean, so, so one of the things I just wanted to so, so, say was with Gilpin, you know, he, he said that mountains had to have an elegant and varied line. Roughness and a certain amount of chaos was desirable. So that's the kind of the rugged, the rugged rocks, the crags and so forth. Distance views, if there's a good foreground, are generally the most pleasing. So it's, um, it's a very prescriptive way, which has is, which is really set the scene for an awful lot of, um, a lot of things since then. Um, Alex identified a photograph of local scenes to serve the tourist market in his early cards and probably unwittingly adopted Gilpin's influence. It would have been there kind of almost subliminally. Uh, and similarly translated the influence as Queen Victoria. And one of the things he did on the right uh, was also he, he took examples from others. So there were some very successful publishing houses, George Washington Wilson and James Valentine, both well, um, Aberdeen for Wilson and uh, Dundee for, for Valentine. They both had royal patronage at one time or another. They had the habit of following each other around, so you get different photographs in the different collections of, from the different publishing houses, and they were quite competitive. Uh, and you also found that various sellers in the, in the streets and they, they sold only one or the other, not both. So they would sell either Wilson's cards or they would sell Valentine's cards. And, and that kind of divided the market. So there's a, there a lot of kind of stuff going on. And then pitched into the middle of that, this is a, a Washington Wilson picture on the left hand side of the Lime Avenue at Castle Grant. And pitched into the middle of that, you've got your local photographers, the likes of uh, Alex Ledding. Uh, did exactly the same subject. Now, it, I mean, how many ways did a photograph a Lime Avenue? All the pictures you see are pretty well like that. They look straight down the middle. There's a great sort of symmetry going on. Uh, but it is quite interesting to, to look at sometimes just how quite how far down the line they went. And, um, and as I say, when they when they replaced. Now that seems to have gone. So that seems to go slightly out of fashion. Um, but it's by the sort of the, the uh, by the end of the First World War. People weren't following that kind of line quite so quite so much. Um, so, but Wilson originated this. He kind of established that picture uh, for what it's worth around 1860. Um, he was one of the ones when when Queen Victoria came to uh, to Granton, and he and she basically told Wilson afterwards. She said, "Well, there are a few things we need to take a record of." And that was basically a royal command to go and get the tail down there and get some photographs, which he did. And the pictures he took in that first visit, you know, quite often set off the, the line of, of future generations photographing. Um, I suspect that one of the Grand Towns earlier on is, is, um, is, is one, of those early, one of those early pictures. Um, so this was one of um, Alec Levin's most enduring views. It was, it was an early shot on the left. Um, there's, you can probably see it actually. So there's a, there's a gentleman on the left there who's wearing a straw boater. He's standing by a bike. There's another bike beside it. On the right of the, of the left-hand picture on the bench there, there's, a, there's another straw boater and a, and a camera bag. Uh, if you look at these very closely. And, and basically what they've done is they've gone down there. Um, now, this is one of these kind of early ones where you're not quite sure, is it Anchor Stewart, is it, is it, is it, is it Alex Leddingham? They both went, they seem to go around together. Um, this is one of Graham's pictures again, and uh, it, it could be either photographer. Uh, it could be letting him in the picture, or it could be it could be Angus Stewart. But um, later on, that same view came in um, much later on and was updated. And that's really the point of this: was just to sort of you, you, you'll see the um, you, you see the pattern in this in, in, in one or two others. But one of the things you have to do with with postcards is to keep your views contemporary. And so, if somebody turns up. And um, you know the view on the left is what they, what you're selling as a postcard. But when they actually go to the place, it's it's like, like the view on the right. They actually want what it looks like. And so postcard photographers always had to update their their, their images. And quite often with glass plates, 
That could mean they actually broke the glass plate, they actually dis disposed of it. It could mean that they cleaned the glass plate, they took all the surface off it and reused the glass. Um, there were a number of ways that, you know, that basically you lose the image and that's again this part of this whole process where you, you sort of update an image, you kind of move on because time and everything moves on and you haven't necessarily created the archive. The archive might remain in the, in the printed work but not in, not in, the, in the glass form. Um, this is another sort of early one, the approach to Granton, very early one. Um, and again, it was, it, was a, it was a view that he returned to time and time again um, in, some, in, 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 well, in, in conditions like this, in snowy conditions, and uh, he did vertical shots, and I think I've got one in later on, vertical shots and also these, these sort of horizontals. Um, it's a very popular theme, and uh, as I say, you know, he, he, he went back there. In these early postcards, these early ones which aren't numbered by him, um, they were quite often taken on by, 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 by merchants, by people selling the images, um, and on the back of those might be, um, well, it could be Angus Stewart as a, as a, as a, as a merchant, uh, Calder and Dolman Bridge was another one, and there were various merchants who would have bought a quantity of cards in return and used them as some form of advertising. So I think they were distributed from those from their own shops, and um, I think probably the, the, the sort of tragic loss of Ang Angus Stewart died tragically uh, in the Spain in 1912, and I think having been sort of operating for two or three years, probably putting uh, producing these unnumbered um, postcards, I think that was the trigger that prompted Alex Levingham to to move into his own publishing house to move into his own and, and sort of firmly establish a brand on his postcards so that he distributed to the merchants and they were selling his postcard range. And there's, there's quite a distinction in that. Um, views such as this one are a little bit cryptic, uh, shall we say, as to their location. Um, but they were probably produced very much with, you know, with, with a very specific market in mind. Uh, and I've got another example coming up as well, where there's, there's just quite a, you know, you, you can slightly wonder, you know, why do you take the picture? Do you know, it's a nice view, it's got the cairngorms in the back and all that kind of stuff, but it, it, is, is it a viewpoint that people go to? Is it, is it something that people will experience regularly? Um, what is the view? I, I couldn't, I didn't know where it was. I mean, I, I usually record I know the cairngorms really well. I couldn't place that one at all. And it was only um, some time later that I, I came across another uh, reproduction of that card, probably an earlier reproduction. So that first one was, was, was in, within the Levingham range. This one, somebody has helpfully <laughs> put, the, uh, put the caption on it. And, um, you know, and that, it's from Dolman Bridge. And also this one had the credit on the back as uh, Jay Calder had done it um, down at Dolman and was obviously the market. So those have been produced as a bespoke uh, postcard for that particular, for that particular merchant. There's another one, number two, in the postcard range. There are about 285 postcards numbered, I think. Um, that's kind of where I've got to on the, on the numbering. Um, I don't, certainly don't have all of them. Um, I've got most of them, but I haven't, there's some I haven't got, and some that are very difficult to untangle in terms of numbering. One of, one of the things I, I set out to do, which I don't, I'm not sure I will be able to ever get there, but was to actually just try and get a catalogue of what he did and where, when he did it, and some of the some of the repeats and some of the variations. So I have I have got quite a bit of, of that kind of stuff together. But this one I think is a lovely a lovely picture, and I like the you know the sort of handwriting on it and the, and the number um, and the and just the whole the whole scene really I think is is, is very decorative. Um, so number two of two hundred eighty five, and to that you can probably add another hundred or so at least. Uh, what I've called event cards. So they're, they're, they're cards that have been sort of produced but unnumbered. Um, things like the, the, the Kansas of Seafield's funeral and various others. There's at least a hundred of those um, kicking around as well, which are all stamped Alex Leddingham, but we're not including the general postcard range, which would have been much higher print runs. So the postcard range covers Strathspey and Badenoch and reaches into Nairn um, and extends from Dulcie Bridge in the north 
Loch Arn and Bray Rake and the Cairngorms and the east, so Kinloch Lagan in the southwest, and 40 or so miles uh, almost to the Badenoch and Loch Arbor March. So it's it's quite a quite an extensive range, a very extensive range, I would say. Um, in fact, looking at various photographers in, in the Cairngorms, and there was, a, there was one quite notable one down at Newton Moor called um, Anderson. Um, uh, he, he, he did Newton Moore, he did Newton Moore very, very well, but there were, there were no others who actually embraced the whole of the district and actually travelled and survived. And Alex went around on his motorbike, um, Sandy latterly remembers some of his stuff uh, where, where he'd go out for photographs and he'd go in the sidecar with him and travel quite long distances, you know, sort of, um, quite, quite long distances, in order to get the photographs, get, get the pictures. Um, and I divided the book into, into some of the uh, into, into divisions of the, um, the various districts, uh, just, just for convenience, um, which we'll, we'll look at. So, and I was talking about Wilson being an originator, setting a view, and I think this is one example where actually Levian might have formed the view. And this view in the Cairngorms, number 197, picture of the, the, uh, the pine tree at the mouth of the Larry Drew on Rotherham Oakers are saved. And it's a view that I've got at least 18, I think, different, different photographs of. Um, I'm a bit geeky like that. I see one and I get a different, you know, a different publisher or whatever else. I've got quite a, quite a batch of them. These are just kind of representative. I think they sort of basically go, um, yeah, sort of top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right which takes you basically from the, about the 19 teens, somewhere up into the 1970s. And um, as I say, what's probably happened there is that Ledding's, he's not been a victim of his own success, but he's put out a card and other people have kind of copied that. I think this is the earliest one. And it's, 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 it's a really interesting kind of evolution of stuff. And you can see, um, so for example, some of the, some of the environmental impacts. I'm quite interested in just what these pictures can tell you, what sequences of pictures can tell you, what comparison of pictures can tell you. Um, top left one, not a footpath in sight. By the time you get down to the 1970s, the place is pretty well trampled, you know, it's, it's running up, this is, well, especially the Larry Blue path, it's a right away way going through to Bray Mile. Um, and on the left, you can just see, bottom left, so you can just see the, a sort of very narrow footpath forming. Uh, top right isn't, isn't much either. But those are all, it's a, it's a repeated kind of motif, and for some reason that kind of grabbed everybody's attention. Now, you know, one of the things that, that I have done quite a lot of in the past is actually go back to those price, precise locations and, and, and look at, you know, so I'm, I'm actually standing where the photograph was taken. And, and putting a picture around it to, to give it its context, um, just in that in that place. So that's the 1970s and about something like 2009. I picked a pretty good day for that. Um, but the amazing thing is, so you know, I know exactly where the photographer's standing. I know exactly where the tree was. There's not a sign of it. Not a sign of it. And what what happened to that? I asked uh, I asked Johnny Grant in the past as to what might have happened to it. Just don't know. It's somewhere up by Rothenberg's Lodge, if you can really know that kind of place. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's really strange. And whether it's just gone as firewood, whether people use it as firewood up there. And there, there used to be a, a kind of bothy, one of the shelter bothies on the far side of the, of the burn. Possibly it's gone as firewood. But uh, there is not a, not a trace of it. You simply can't find anything. And yet it's only, you know, 40, 40 50 years on. So the first section I, I covered was, was Granton. Uh, it's a view over the town and a really sort of popular, really popular view. And you know these documentaries sort of pick up all sorts of um, all sorts of housing developments and so forth, and, and just different ways. A lot of the trees are actually still you know still in place. They, they are the, one of the enduring kind of features. And there's a lot more trees as well um, in, in various views. This one at Staybridge, Cherry Grove, is it was a constant in the, in the Lennium range and, uh, and indeed in various other uh, postcard ranges as well, um, the old bridge at, 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 um, at Grantown. And um, 
uh, just a sort of timelessly popular view, which whatever happened, people seem to sort of pick up and pick up and buy. It's one that appears on, on eBay, using the index of, of popularity on eBay. It's one that turns up on eBay quite frequently. Um, this one's one, and I haven't got around to examine it, but it's one that came up fairly recently. Um, and I don't actually know where it is. You know, you know, I assume it's granted. I see that one. Yeah. So looking back onto the onto the road there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Cool. So I wasn't sure what that what the building on the right was. That's my. That's just a bungalow. One of the one of the school teachers has it. Okay. That's good. Well, that's really interesting because and um, presumably that would now be masked by trees, would it? Pretty completely, or. Yeah. I think it's called Binet. No, 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 no,
and it's been scrubbed down from the negative. I think I'll actually do, do I actually go in a bit closer on that? I think I do. Let's try it. Yes, there we go. And I think what it is, because um, you can just see this bit where it hasn't been scrubbed down, but it's the scaffolding. It's, it's, it's the piles for building up the old bridge, or the, sorry, the new bridge. Um, and it, such was his kind of keenness to get this into the, into the range. He thought, right, okay, I'll do that. That looks a mess. And so he, he did an early kind of form of photoshopping to take out the, uh, to get the offending, offending structure look. So, so I think that probably times it, or um, yeah, times it fairly specifically into the sort of that kind of period, 31, 1931 would be. Yes, there's an, act, there's an actual photograph showing, showing those. Was all the stuff in I wonder if that's the sort of thing. I think, really, maybe it's out of, out, of the, out of the video. Yeah. Of the opening of the bridge or somewhere else, but, they, oh, um, but it shows, shows the actual sort of, <coughs> almost like pontoons. Okay. Oh, well, that's, yeah, cool. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I shouldn't think so. Well, it's fine. <laughs> um, so then again, you know, this is just an example, you know, classic view across, um, and I suppose it's just really to, to, to sort of um, put in play the, you know, the need for an update. And, uh, you know, I've been working on this. That was, a, that was quite a popular view. And then about 80, 80 postcards on, he's got to refurbish it, review it, um, because of the filling in of the, um, of the hotel there. I think some of the, the, some of the most popular um, pictures out of the exhibition were these, you know, the two of them which were just, just included quite large, but they were just such a, you know, such a, a sort of capture of time um, and, you know, down, down at the, um, the bathing beach or whatever. And, well, you probably get arrested for taking that picture these days, but it does, it does capture both the time and, a, and, a, and a, just a sense of community, and, it's, you know, and I think it, it spoke to a lot of people who, who saw it um, as it was put up. And it's, it's a sort of just a documentary of, of everyday life, um, that, and obviously being a summer activity. This one... Um, a bond steel, obviously, um, but again, was the other one that really attracted people's attention into the, uh, into the exhibition. Again, it's just this you know, sort of silhouette type thing. Number of rinks on the go, stones, just a really great caption. There are, there are three or four of those. Um, I think most of them are held, still held by the family. They've got some quite big prints. I don't think these are in the museum as yet. And I thought I'd just add on to this because, so this is, you know, one of these things, so, you know, the first one we got with the kids, the kids bathing and that doesn't happen much these days. I don't know, I don't think kids do that all that much, certainly not as a big collective group like that. Bonds fields, <coughs> they're not a regular thing. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures that I took in Grand Town in probably about 2003, I think probably 2009 there may have been bonds fields. But, um, you know, it's, is, is there going to be much in the future? If any, just the way climate, the climate is going. Um, so, I, at the time, was getting quite into, I was doing panoramic photographs. There's a similar kind of vibe to it. It's on the same location. Uh, this, I think, was about 2003, when they set up a load of rinks. I'll just include that for a sort of comparison through time. And obviously, it's not something you can completely re -photograph. But um, it was a really, a really good day. Was there any, were any of you there? I don't know. Yeah, Yeah. Not Carolers, but Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was a, it was a busy, busy day that one. Uh, just happened at the right time with a lot of people, and I took a load of photographs. These ones, I was at the time I was working with. Anybody's geeky about cameras. I was working with a, um, a Hasselblad panoramic, so they take a panoramic image on a thirty-five millimeter film. They're, they're a lovely camera, and almost something you can use by hand, you know, handheld. And uh, so I did quite a lot of these 
on, on, on the day. Um, so events, another section, unnumbered cards, producing relatively low numbers, purchased for albums and record of local events. Um, this is the flooding that took place at the Baden Gorn Burn in early July 1923, um, described in the Times as the most sudden and violent floods within memory in the district. Um, those smaller floods had hit the same localities in 1914, but Lenin was obviously hot foot out there, took these pictures, and they, 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 do, they do turn up. I think he must have published a few of them, and quite a few of them were, were, were bought. They were also used in a, in a journal to record um, the, the event. Um, rainfall journal. This one I think is the is, is, is one of the most poignant of the of the photographs and one of the, one of the best ones in the in the collection. I think it's a, it's a really sharp, beautiful image. The departure of the soldiers to the Great War. It was a notable public event and. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, Alex was at the time was in his thirties, and he didn't sign up immediately. Um, but following the conscription of the Military Service Act in 1916, he was called. Um, but both he and William Stewart delayed that con conscription. So Alex joined the Royal Engineers um, and was apparently able to use his photographic skills as part of his service. Um, that was um, uh, I've not, again, I've not seen the, the, the photographs that come out of that. But that's the kind of sort of family. Um, family view that he, he, he was able to use his, his photographic skills, either in printing or whatever. His photography was becoming a bit more used in the First World War, um, both the survey of trenches and aerials and, and lots, of, lots of processing and um, scrutiny of those images. So they were involved in that. Another section of and he also photographed people. This is Lucinda Ross. Uh, the owner of the Benmore Hotel uh, in her wedding dress, apparently. Wedding dress still survives. You can see it's a, it's a studio picture. Um, there's the, the, the painted backdrop and uh, detail of the gown she wore is, is, you know, is quite extraordinary. Um, it's one of, the, one, of the, one of the portraits made in the probably the wooden studio on Space Street. And, uh, and Lucinda Ross, there's, there's several sort of versions of this one. And, uh, and the dress, the dress still exists. It's, it's in New Zealand. Apparently, we couldn't get it back for the exhibition, which would be fantastic. But um, it's still, it's still in the family. This gentleman was eventually identified at the museum this year. Um, he was a regular visitor to Grand Town, and um, I really like this as a, as, a, as a sort of formal portrait in the outdoors. And you know. It, it obviously involves quite a bit of coordination and collaboration um, as a part of what was supplied by Grand Town itself because it was being coordinated by the ghillie, uh, somebody who was out with the fishermen. Um, the fish had been prepared and hung on a stick for display. The gentleman has had the time to go and change into his best attire. Presumably he didn't fish in that lot. And um, the photo photographer, Alex Lankham, has been summoned to document the scene on, you know, on location down on the beach there. And it's, um, it's, it's, I think it's a really great shot. Um, surprisingly small reel and uh, surprisingly big fish. It's, um, as I say, I think he's, he's now been identified. This one, oops, this one you, you may have seen as well. Um, this is a portrait of Mary Hogg and Shona Grant. This is Vickerman. Um, Shona came along to the, um, to the launch in, in June. And this is, it's, it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a fantastic you know, portrait and showcases perfectly Alex Ledium's skill as a photo artist. Because what you can't really pick out without seeing it closely. Oh, let's just go that one. But these are all. These are all actually hand drawn. The red lines, the blue fill in, it's all painted. So it's a hand tinted. It's not an oil paint like the first one, like the other, like the Angus Grant one. This is just a sort of putting on a uh, sort of translucent painted. So it's a photographic paint that goes on a black and white photograph and creates a colour image. Um, and so it's all hand tinted. And you can see some, some areas which are 
a little bit sort of roughly done. As I say, you, you just pick out the, just how these have been sort of put in as roughly as a, as a, as a check. But um, they are fantastic. It's a fantastic portrait. And it's quite a big one. 1954 that was done. So it's right at the end of his, of his career, but obviously something that he wanted to put together well. Um, and then just that one as well. Again, that's um, Mrs. Dickerman, Sean Le Grant. Um, a classic studio portrait. It's really, really great backdrop. And um, apparently she said they, they had a sort of a style of dressing up every weekend. And uh, I tried to document this. So it's a really good studio, studio portrait. It's lovely to have. I think one of the great documentaries, which was actually done on a full plate, so a lot of these are half plate size, they're about seven by five, this is done on a full plate, quality is absolutely fantastic, of the Castle Ground pictures, um, and I've just got a couple in this slot, uh, the dining room, um, and also the, the armoury, both of which you've probably seen, but uh, again, if you, if you have a chance to, to, to look at the actual, the actual image, the, the, the quality of these is just superb. You can almost read the inscriptions on into some of the metalwork, and uh, you can get really good detail. I mean, they're, they're a fantastic documentary of the, of the castle as it was. Uh, I, I don't think any of this exists there now. It's, um, it's all been scattered. Locations, uh, Dulcy Bridge. Um, really the postcard that he would, again was a popular one which he managed to, to put out. <coughs> and a local view. Quite, I find this one quite interesting because it's got a sort of figure just in there. And he obviously, you know, he could have waited for him to not be in the picture, or he could have waited for him to be further in the picture, out of the picture that way, uh, or, or closer, indeed closer to the bottom right. But he's put him right there. And it's obviously a very conscious, conscious sort of uh, placing of this figure within the, within the photograph. And Bateman, the far end from, um, from, from Alex, I mean, you know, 30, 40 miles of times to, to get to, but he put it on the map and uh, certainly sold cars locally there. There are quite a few in Newton Moor, uh, of Newton Moor. Um, which he did, and he obviously had a good a good market there. These are on Loch Inch, Cubes on Loch Inch, or near King Craig as he calls it. Um, this one, well, I just put this one up just to just to show some of the changes. So this is uh, the Spey Bridge at Newton Moor. Now that's the old Spey Bridge. That's the one that was a sort of Caulfield Bridge and was taken down in the nineteen twenties, mid twenties. This one is a concrete bridge, which went in, opened in 27 or 28. And a lot's happened in these kind of, in this kind of part. This is the bit where the colder, the river colder comes out of Glenbarker and joins the river Spey from right at that point. The, the river moves around quite a bit anyway, but um, it's only through looking through the pictures and the, the, the house there sort of has given me a very precise location because the alignment of the chimneys, kind of rocket, there, as the, just the way it is. Um, I've got it off the, off the picture on the right and very precisely located the tripod in the, in the river here as to where um, Lenningham stood. And looking at the photographs, I mean, it seems obvious, but I've never quite picked up. You know, you think about rivers moving around this way, they wander across floodplains, they sort of calm and they deposit and everything else. But actually what's happening as well, all the time, is they're actually cutting down and the, the level is changing. So they're not just wandering, they're, they're actually cutting down. And that, I find it you know, is quite extraordinary, some of the, the, the sheer volume of, of rubble that gets shifted around by a relatively small river. But it's pretty small up there, really. Um, you'd be surprised. Anyway, that's it. so that's that's the sort of the bread and butter of some of the stuff I was looking at, uh, well, both from an environmental point of view, but also just trying to sort of place, I suppose, change within you know within the context of what tourists appreciate these days. And so, you know, whereas you might get away, you might want a photograph of a, of a lovely Caulfield Bridge uh, on the right there. Would you want the same picture on the left? 
Mm, don't think so. Would you send it to your granny? I'm not sure you would. Um, so. That's okay. You okay. Uh, Newton Moore Golf Course. So I'm just going to, I'm just, I, I didn't put all the Newton Moore ones in the, in the book, but I just got, you know, there aren't quite a few. And this is a really fantastic one. It's a, it's a great image, this. Not only for the sort of the distance in it. Um, you can't really see it in this, in this view, perhaps, perhaps you can. But there are actually, there are actually golfers down the bottom left here. There's a guy <laughs> fishing in the middle here. This is a view straight forward to the bridge. This is the, actually the arch of the bridge, which you've not a hope of seeing now because of the trees. Um, and if any, I don't know if any of you are golfers, but if you are golfing, you need to meet more. This is where you cross over the, over the, over the railway and come down into the, into the greens here. Um, this is what used to be called at Avon Clooney. Um, and in fact, it used to belong to the landing on the far side of the stay. So they used to come this side of it. Uh, and there was a certain degree of disgruntlement when it suddenly went this way, and they ended up with quite a few hectares less. Um, and then, sorry, what was going to get to on that one? Uh, so that's sort of putting it in context. Um, and you know, I looked at this picture and I thought, well, I wonder where that is. And I, you know, I felt I knew more reasonably, golf course reasonably well, but. Not a scooby of where that was. And I went rummaging around and eventually crossed the bridge at the back of the folk park and came across this, which is which is actually an old an old fort. And right on the side of it, on this quite a steep slope, he must have been standing. And, and that's you know that's his viewpoint. Um, Craig Dew on the right there, um, the Binion and uh, one of the hills at uh, Cruden Moor, uh, sort of in the middle. And then um, you can see the almost as, you know the scars of the the river comes around and masses of trees have just grown up alongside there. And it gives you a bit of a date on that, so they're, you know, they're, they're probably about 100 years old, I suppose. Um, but the landscape has changed completely. Uh, and you can see where the, the spay uh, comes around and goes up here. Um, what they call the, well, they call the Braid of Nude. Uh, this, is, this is just on the, on the banks of Nude Farm here, Nude Farms over here. I've actually changed landscape since I took that as well because these pylons have come of uh, the bridge. So, yeah. um, so a bit further, further upstream. This is so the picture of the Spay Bridge. Also taken from somewhere down here, down here. Um, this one is um, a view from the bridge. Um, it's probably the new bridge, I suspect. I don't think it was that old bridge. I think he went back and took a few pictures around there. And um, so, you know, the date is roughly 1927, somewhere about that time. Shows the floodplain as it was, um, you know, before Fort Hydro, before anything else. Um, and, you know, while, it, while sort of inevitably opportune, he's also chosen the moment the photograph when the steam train goes by on a higher line, so it's got a bit of a bit of life in that, and uh, and you can stand in that exact same exact same place, and it, it just you know letting those photographs um, for for all their kind of commercial worth as postcards, I mean, really provides a really good documentary of the landscape as was um, across the whole of the district. Um, That's the view today. Uh, it's a very different, very different landscape. That's, that's the direct comparison. And the rock here, um, well, the pool here, uh, the pool here, which isn't really a pool all that much anymore, but it's called Paul Cregan, Pool of the Rock, that's the rock. And, um, yeah, it's a very changed river, and that's, that's as a result of the hydro scheme, uh, reduced grazing, with fewer sheep on the land, um, all sorts of reasons, which I'm not bored with, but anyway, it, it, it's quite an interesting comparison.
Another section of the Cairngorms, that's the, that's the view with the, uh, with the trees, which I think is quite, as I say, quite an influential one. Um, really nice photograph. Um, he also photographed monuments. This is, there's a number of plateau scenes. Uh, postcards also have two memorials. Uh, this one, uh, there's one that sat in the middle of the ski area in Corrie Cass, uh, which has since been moved. And this one that Todd grew. Uh, which is now pretty well engulfed by trees, to be honest. Um, and this is a memorial to Baird and Barry, who lost in Ken in 1928, uh, which was under search for them. It was about New Year, I think it was early part of the year. Um, the search for them was one of the first coordinating mountain rescues in the Highlands. And this is the final resting place of Barry, Hugh Barry. And he, uh, the boulder on top carries a line from a poem he wrote the year before his death which was quite prophetic and includes the, the line, find me a windswept boulder for a buyer, and on it lay me down. Which is pretty well what they did, because I, I gather he's, he's actually interred there. And uh, um, there was, uh, was, was, was taken home. But it's a, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a documentary and something I think people would have been keen to purchase um, as a record of their attendance at that, that place. Another Ken Gorm's view. Um, it's not a it's not a kind of bodice ripper in terms of in terms of selling cards, um, but undoubtedly the snow patch, the Kubikron, the head wall of the Cass, which um, well it doesn't it, it, it's it's not it, it, it used to last well as you'll know it used to last into sort of July sometimes into early August now very seldom gets out of June to be quite honest. And um, this picture on the left was taken, and it, it's pretty well within the shadow of the, the, the top wheel of the, of the toe of the cast, um, literally just behind me where I'm standing there. And when you start getting into, when you, because one of the ways I look at these pictures is to, is to put one over the other in Photoshop, and then you change the opacity so you can see one through the other, and you can change that in order to get a registration exactly. And when you start looking through all this, all the boulders, they're all, they're all in place. Uh, just the close-in ones have all changed around. I think that one could be this one, but the rest of them are just pretty well sort of moved about. But it's an interesting exercise, as I say, and just on the same sort of pattern of snow. I, I can't claim that as a, as a direct um, repeat, because I don't know when, when it was taken. But yeah, I would have thought, looking at the amount of snow on that, it's likely to be a July picture. And, uh, and the one on the right was as well, but it, it doesn't tell you anything. But, you know, if you can't get it, it's as year to year. So that, I think, is about me. That's a, that's a sort of, um, sort of whiz through some of, the, some of the photographs we looked at and included, and some of the comparisons I've been working on. And, um, yeah, happy to take any pictures of us. Any uh, questions of us? Yeah. Well, thank you, thank okay. you very much. It's it's been a it's been a, a, a real eye opener. Just you know, that's a pretty picture. Oh, but it's so so much more, isn't it? It's a it's a history. It's a it's a geography lesson. It's about it's about people and it's about a, a whole technique of, of taking pictures. So for that, you know, we are we are deeply grateful. And, Several of the pictures, obviously, because uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, the, 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 yeah. A link, comments, questions, questions or comments. Yeah, or yeah. Well, very, very much. What we sort of tend to do is time for two or three general questions and comments, but you'll inevitably get a whole string more <laughs> as, as we tidy up and so yeah, on. Yeah. But any anything? For, I'm sorry, I'm starting to new. Any particular? Is, the, is that Glanton? Golf club there. It is. It's a uh, second hole. Could be. I don't know. Is it second yeah. hole? Yeah. Okay. If a date comes in from the left from Heathfield, you can see it in the distance here. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's a funny one that because you, you, I think it, that's the one where you've got sort of two girls positioned by the by the first one golf, but then there's a couple of boys sitting down on the bunker. They just sort of landed right, right in the middle of the shop, you know, right in the way he's about to. They're just sort of lying on the on the side of the bank. Um, 
But yes, they did, they did a few of those um, golf club ones. Um, they're, they're strange photographs from a compositional point of view because there's not much you can do with them. And you know, the one thing, although you've got you've got sort of Shona there on the on the right, and that's what I'm going to leave for her to to kind of look at um, and and to, and to purchase. But the, the people tend not to buy pictures of people unless you've got a particularly sort of rugged or famous character. Um, I would say so. Pictures of figures in a golf club. Are quite, are quite difficult to place and quite difficult to, to market. That's just a general comment, I suppose. There's another one on the ninth tee, and it's Bill Templeton, who's a left hander. Okay. He's playing, and Sandy's in the picture. Oh, is he? And I think his father just said, Look, go and stand. Good, <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs>